Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us, yes, establish the work of our hands. He or she who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Shall we pray together? Father, we are gathered together in your name, in that magnificent name of Jesus, the one who called us, the one who knows us by name. And Father, we thank you for this magnificent day you've given us. Indeed, Douglas himself would have been impressed in the beauty and the majesty of this day. Thank you for the gift of his life to us. And we come, Lord, today firstly to worship you, to honor the one who gives us life. We come, Lord, also to hear your shepherd's heart comforting us, whispering truth into our souls, comforting the family. We pray, Lord, that your living presence would guide and lead us through this service and that your name would be lifted up. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He or she who believes in me will live even though they die. Weeping remains for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray that you would uniquely and powerfully lead and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, welcome to the service. I wonder if I could just ask you, if you've got a cell phone with you, maybe you could um, turn it off uh, just, to, just to help us in, in the service. And then on behalf of Paul and Faith and the extended family and Wendy and the crew that's come down from uh, up the coast, on behalf of them, thanks for being here and welcome to the service. It is a, a service of the celebration of Douglas Crawford's life. What a life, friends. What a life. What a life lived. So we come to celebrate. We come to give thanks. We come to be together. We come to be together with God. We come to be with the family and to experience God. So when we sing, friends, we need to sing as Douglas would want us to sing. We need to remember, you know, him as the person among us who touched so many lives. The, the amount of messages and things, you know, that have come through about the lives that have been touched through this life. So let's honor the God who gave life to Douglas. So we're going to stand together. Isn't it a magnificent picture? He's a good looking fellow, isn't he? Uh, and uh, so the first song is in the brochure, How Great Thou Art, O Lord My God, O Lord Our God. Uh, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands. And let's stand to him, stand together and sing to him in adoration and worship. Oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the... Stand in awesome wonder. We lift our eyes to the one who made the heavens and the earth. We declare your majesty, your power. We see your splendor displayed in your universe. We thank you, God, that you whisper to us each morning that your grace is sufficient. And today we worship the great I am, the one with whom Douglas walked with by faith. We praise and honor you, living God. Amen. Amen, friends. Won't you please be seated? And uh, um, Rod is going to come up uh, and share with us. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
my saliva glands don't work properly and I have to chew gum, so please just accept that um, while I talk. Uh, that's what the doctors have prescribed. I've known Douglas and been a friend and colleague of his for 44 years. And if I did not believe, absolutely and totally believe, in the resurrection of the dead and life everlasting, then this would be a very, very sad day. Instead, I'm actually filled with joy at the sheer privilege of being able to honour Christ Jesus and to honour my friend Douglas. Wendy, I'm convinced, absolutely convinced, just as Paul puts it to the church in Corinth. You know, I'm a Greek, and those were troublesome Greeks, so it's good that I understand this, that God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us also. So my darling, while I talk about, uh, talk about Douglas, please focus on Jesus, and all of us, please focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, because I think there's nothing else that Douglas would want from us, and certainly nothing less that Jesus would be the one that gets the attention. Murray, thank you for letting me talk today. Um, about 14 years ago, Douglas corresponded with me about the funeral. <laughs> Douglas is well organized. Um, thinking whatever may happen and uh, asked would I talk at the funeral, but made it very clear that whatever church he belonged to at that time, and it was this one and under Murray, that Murray would have the last say. As to, as to who would speak. So thank you. I'm just thrilled. I will resist all temptations to preach, but I do want to sow two scriptures into your head. One, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead, and he will raise us also. 1 Corinthians 6, and then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus raised from the dead. So whenever you think about Jesus, remember that he has been raised from the dead. So Stephen Covey wrote a famous book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. The South African edition had a subtitle, Seven Habits Out of the Life of Douglas Crawford. <laughs> Here's a one-liner out of Covey's book. Uh, live, love, and leave a legacy. And I'm so pleased you began where you did today, talking about the way Douglas's life has been a life well-lived. So... Paul and Faith, one of the many things Daddy did was to, to organize retreats for whoever, but on one particular retreat with some ministers, he had written into the program in about four or five places the word relax, relax. But as one of the people on the retreat, a colleague of ours said, only Douglas Crawford could write into a spiritual retreat program the word relax in bold capitals with an exclamation mark, relax. <laughs> in the very place where you were meant to be relaxed. He was a minister of the gospel for 41 years before he retired for the second time. That's when he became a member here at Summer Strand, and I'm sure he dabbled uh, in the ministry here as well. So as a leading lay minister, lay person rather, and as a minister, he served eight congregations and helped establish seven new ones. Most of you will know he was a civil engineer, was also a scoutmaster. He helped start Lifeline in Cape Town. He was a Sunday school teacher, and long before his ordination, he was leading people to Christ. And I've received several emails from people saying that. He was the best, and there is simply no exaggeration in that. He was the absolute very best director of Christian education that our church has ever known. He was also moderator of General Assembly, and broke the mold on some of the stuffiness around that position and the role of the moderator. He was crazy about swimming, which most of you will know, absolutely loved water, but I liked making him crazy about something else. Our churches in Cape Town were just a few kilometers apart, and we would often travel to meetings together. Of course, he would never let me drive. I mean, you could bet your house on that boy. He had to be in charge. But I knew he loved chocolate. Now, my dad worked for a, a couple of different chocolate companies as we were growing up, so we were never without the stuff, and so we never had to gorge it in any sense. Well, Douglas loved the stuff. And he is what I would call a slab swallower. <laughs> Swiftly. 
So I'd get into the car and then put, as we turned from our church onto the N1 going into Cape Town, I'd put on the dashboard just out of his reach a chocolate. Well, conversation stopped. Driving became more aggressive <laughs> until he demanded that I unwrap it just sufficiently so that there was a piece of paper left that he could hold and not get his fingers dirty. And then it disappeared. It slid out of sight as he just swallowed the whole thing. I've never known anybody to eat a chocolate quite so fast. And then he would smile. He would just sort of <laughs> smile to himself. He lived and he hated wasting time. Short phone calls, quick AGMs. The shortest AGM at the Durbanville Church when he was there was two minutes. Two minutes. He got up and said, uh, the only reason for an AGM, according to the book, is you have to receive the accounts and appoint an auditor. You've had the accounts for two weeks. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, you know who the auditor is? We're happy. We're happy with the price. All in favor? Aye. Meeting closed. <laughs> he even tried to persuade me to wear suede shoes like he wore. When I asked why, he looked at me sort of nonplussed and said, you don't have to waste time polishing them. <laughs> I remember sitting with your mom and dad having many fun times in all sorts of ways. We went to Maynardville together to watch Shakespeare. We went out to dinner every now and again. We ate uh, in your folks' home, always beautifully, marvelously presented. One of your mom's recipes is one of my favorites, the sloppy joes. I don't know if you make them or eat them yourselves, but they're just absolutely great. But we did go <laughs> to one Christmas lunch together, Mandy and myself, Douglas and Rhoda, and oh my heavens, it was like a food frenzy. <laughs> it was a, a very, a very well-known good hotel in Cape Town, but it was just so odd. It was elbows out and push to get to the last chicken leg, which was just really terrible. And it was something just quite different to what food in your home was like and so beautifully done. So, it's not surprising this man lived as long as he did, well into the 90s, and it's also not surprising that he was seriously burnt out twice in his life and in the ministry and took a break from the ministry each time for several years. But he lived. Live and love. This is a bit tender now, so please just be patient with me and let's try and give all glory to Jesus as I talk about Douglas and love. It's too complicated and certainly too private to go into detail, but at some point, many, many years ago, he asked me to become his confessor. He wanted to be accountable to someone. So in many ways over the years, we would talk, phone, or correspond about his life. It's no secret that Douglas and Rhoda suffered a divorce when he was at the very height of his parish ministry at Durbanville, both of them. Everything was going absolutely well. Excuse me, Murray, I am a Greek, I am a bit rough, but this was just a serious brain fart in Douglas's mind. I told him at the time it was wrong, that he would have to repent of it, that he would have to work for reconciliation. And of course they were together again with 11 months and, and remarried, but it cost them and cost their children and cost the congregation, and cost the denomination dearly, dearly. It cost the ministers fraternal and other churches in the area dearly. So Paul and Faith, uh, whether you've been aware of this or not, in those dark times, he loved you, loved you, and repented deeply that he had hurt you, and hurt Rhoda, and hurt the people in the church, and hurt the wider church, and especially hurt the people who loved you as a family. And he asked for and ached for full reconciliation, and I am so deeply thankful that you gave it to him and as fully as you have. He and I have the unwanted and unenviable reputation of both being publicly rebuked by the sitting moderator of General Assembly for things we had done wrong, Douglas for the divorce, me, that's my own business, I'm not certainly not telling you today. <laughs> but I can tell you for both Douglas and myself, the rebuke hurt deeply, and it's meant to sting. But it wasn't the rebuke that hurt, it was for Douglas that people who are mischief makers 
would now question his love. That because of the failing in some way, this would now question his ability to love and to continue loving. Of course, he taught and he practiced and believed, love Jesus with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love others. And again, I've got correspondence from people who have just been deeply affected and benefited from his love for them in Christ Jesus. And Wendy, he loved you. He loved you. When I married the two of you, uh, seven, almost seven years ago in Belleville, and we went up to a little Greek cafe to have cakes and tea, you may remember that, uh, he loved you. I'm not even sure if you were aware that he wrote to me, maybe even before he asked you to tell me that he had fallen in love, and with such joy and excitement, telling me of the one that he had met, and, and would I conduct the ceremony when it came around. But I'm going to guess that given both of you are fairly strong personalities, that you may have had, as all marriages have, moments from time to time when you rubbed each other up, not with lotions, but with frustrations. But I want to say this is one of the peculiar things about Douglas in this relationship, is he never once even hinted at anything other than this was sheer absolute bliss. He loved you. And I was deeply grateful for that. So live. Enjoy your life. If you want to honor him in any way, then live fully. And love. And love as fully as you can. And a legacy, well, quite simply, it was immense. Uh, I've mentioned the number of congregations that he was involved in, but that doesn't come anywhere close to the number of lives in and out of those congregations across 41 years uh, of, of ordained ministry and then the rest um, that he's affected. Amongst other things that we've almost forgotten but are there, uh, we started a Bible college in Cape Town. He started in our denomination lay leaders conferences, persuading ordinary members that you are equipped to be ministers of the gospel like anybody else for the upbuilding of the church. He organized renewal days of prayer and praise right across the church. He preached, I just think, probably in every single um, presbytery. He visited hospitals especially hospitals and elderly people. Now, that may sound ordinary, but let me tell you, most young ministers don't like doing that now. <laughs> we are either threatened by it or just don't like doing it. He challenged racial prejudice, prejudice in our denomination in places where many of us were silent. And he was so marvelously influential in debates in the church. Nearly finished. I remember one occasion in the presbytery of Cape Town as happens in church debates, we had gone back and forwards and back and forwards about something or the other and were finally ready to make a decision that was clearly going to be a wrong decision. You sensed it, but no one had the courage to say it. And Douglas, in about two-thirds back, jumped up, shouted out loud, and came forward to the microphone saying, Moderator, this is just crazy. This is just irresponsibly crazy. And then he helped us see this and understand this and move in the right way. So in the early church, it was the Roman pagans and the Greek philosophers and shopkeepers <laughs> and the Jewish hierarchy who said of us Christians, you're crazy. You're just crazy to believe in someone coming back from the dead. But the Douglas Crawfords of the early church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers said, we're not crazy because we've met him. We know he is alive. So thank you, Murray, and fellow friends and worshippers for listening to this thin tribute about a fat legacy that my friend has given to us. He loved, and he lived for the Lord Jesus. And so he loved people and gave his life for them too. He would have me say, remember Jesus raised from the dead and put your lives into his eternal care as he did and as he is with Christ now. God bless you all. Thank you. My tribute comes from Wendy. And uh, Wendy shares... Douglas and I have been married for six years now and living happily at Bushman's River Mouth. He had a love for water until quite recently swam in the river even when other people found it too cold. We were really happy together 
Now that he is gone, I have some mixed emotions. Firstly, I'm very sad as I have lost a really dear companion. Douglas has been kind and patient, besides being a very interesting person to converse with. We often had philosophical discussions. For instance, just as he was going to sleep, I would ask something like, Douglas, do you really believe in angels? And his answers were always sensible and very thoughtful. We shared our enjoyment of music, clouds, birds, and many things which I shall miss. And we prayed together. My second emotion is gratitude for the fun times we had together. We so enjoyed our trips to the metropolis of Port Alfred. <laughs> Very importantly, I'm grateful for the Bible studies that we held in our house for some years. Douglas being a really spiritful teacher. I really appreciate the lovely group that attended who became our dearest friends, many of whom are here today. I'm especially grateful to Rod Burton, the minister of, of Kenton Methodist Church, who has taken the trouble to come here, and he's here today, and then Glenn Craig is also here from Kenton, uh, and then Rod Botsis, uh, who's just shared up from, from Cape Town. And Wendy continues, I really also appreciate the way Paul and Faith have visited their dad regularly, spoilt him, and brought him gifts. Then, in a way, I'm filled with joy that Douglas is escaping a really difficult, very old age. He could no longer read with fading eyesight, and he, needed to aid, and he needed aid to walk. I'm sure that Douglas is now in a better place, free of bodily discomforts, as he put it, in another dimension. Mysterious, as we don't fully understand it. But one thing he believed with is in his unshakable faith, that in some way he would meet up with his divine creator, whom he served faithfully and diligently all of his days. Thanks so much, Wendy. And Tristan is going to just share on behalf of the family. Thanks, Tristan. Good morning, everyone. It's a little higher. As a family, we've been so blessed to have a, a father and a grandfather like Douglas. Like Grandpa, that's how I've known him. And he was always fun to be around. He, he was the eternal optimist. Um, he always carried around this enthusiasm, um, which he, um, he would always tell us that that word actually meant to be in God, um, which was just quite a revelation for me. But he had this energy about him that was quite contagious. Um, some observations in terms of his interests and things that, that I benefited and quite enjoyed. Grandpa was an avid lover of Mr. Bean. Um, and he'd often just ring off um, many of Mr. Bean's sayings in his accent. Um, and once we actually went to watch Mr. Bean's holiday um, at Hall Park a um, long time ago, um, and it was just a, a real fabulous time. Um, I too had the, the great joy of often jumping into the, the swimming pool at Dunan Park, um, always under his observation, as it had to be, and he had this, this amazing ability to squirt water with his hand, meters, like way over the wall into like the residents' houses um, next door and water their plants and gardens. I never really got the hang of it. Um, he obviously spent so much time in the water that he just had to work out like things to do, you know. Um, <laughs> Grandpa, Grandpa loved to discover new things, and you always knew when you'd found out about something that was new, he would he would love to share that with you. Um, I remember probably about ten years ago now, he had found out about this retreat centre called Humble Ways up in the Lovemore Forest area in Port Elizabeth, and he actually drove me up there and took me there and showed me round. Um, and that just really echoed his love for retreat um, and being with, with um, God in stillness. Grandpa always had very beady eyes, and they almost got more beady as he noticed things. <laughs> he would look around a room, and you just thought, oh, no, he's seen someone or something um, that, that caught his attention. Um, and he would, he would love telling very interesting stories and at a certain point, those beady eyes came alive as he would share the cracks of the story. Um, for us, we knew, we knew about um, Uncle Joe and Auntie Susie, which were make-believe characters, but to us were very real. And before bedtime, for quite some years, he would share stories and adventures about Uncle Joe 
and Auntie Susie, none of which I can recall today, unfortunately. But in the moment, they were really mesmerizing. Um, and, and often at the end of his story, especially in his latter years, he would use the phrase, how about that? Hey, remember that? How about that? And that was just truly Douglas. That was just him. Um, Douglas would definitely have made the top 10 global rankings for the, the computer game called Tetris. Um, and he would, he would play at least five or 10 rounds daily. Um, and he just loved to do that. He loved his computer time um, just, to, just to wind down. But my grandpa was also a man who was filled with ingenious ideas many of which we've heard about, um, planting many churches and so on. Um, one of the ingenious things that he did is that he, he would write his sermon um, on an envelope um, quite often, and he would, he would write it on the front and the back, and if he ran, uh, ran out of space, he would know that he would be too long. Um, and so that little envelope um, r yeah, really just kept his entire sermon. I've, I've never got the hang of that. Um, I've got a goldfish memory, so I need to, you know, bullet point everything. Mine's pages. Um, but apparently, often he just had an envelope. Um, and he would even carry one of those in his pocket in case he was called upon to preach um, with no prep time. Um, so, you know, I think a, a big reason that I find myself in full-time Christian ministry today is because of my grandfather. Um, and quite some years back, the late Richard Maybury, um, who we as a family loved, um, Richard and his family and Jackie and the kids, um, with such love. They were a big part of our life growing up. And at, at one time, Richard actually prophesied over my life that, that I would carry the mantle of my grandfather in ministry. Um, and just to, just to hear those words, to just hear that spoken over my life was, was such a powerful thing. And I've, I've learned so much from how he used to preach. Um, he never used to preach too long. Um, and yet he was always very practical. He would always walk away with something. Um, and I just loved that about him. But through it all, I can honestly say that my grandpa gave back to the world. He wasn't a taker, he was a giver. And he sowed into so many people's lives through planting a string of churches, building up existing churches, and loving countless people and raising up countless leaders. Thousands of lives were changed through his ministry. Um, I think so much of his success in ministry was also owed to, to my late grand Rhoda, who was just beside him, loving him, supporting him, and consistent in that role. Um, and she had to be patient with him, um, because he often would be running around with his type A personality, um, which I unfortunately have as well. Um, <laughs> one of the blessings that I received from him. Um, but it's, it's been such... A blessing to know him and I think one of the things that I'm most grateful for was on on, on Monday morning I had the opportunity at Greenacres Hospital to pray with him to hold his hand and he was fully conscious and aware of it and we prayed and I just prayed a peace upon his life and there was something that just rested upon him from that um, and it's just such a privilege just to have that moment um, with him and so behalf on behalf of our family we are sad but also joyful that grandpa's gone because we know that he's with our loving father. Um, that's a place that I often just long to be. Um, we will miss him dearly, but we'll never th um, forget him or his legacy. And that will live on in our hearts. And so we are forever grateful to grandpa and to Douglas. Thank you very much. Because we're going to sing together. Um, it's on your... My worship friends, um, and it's amazing grace. Uh, Douglas loved these hymns. These are his hymns. He gave us the outline of the service. He gave us the hymns. He gave us the scriptures. Uh, Douglas, our friend, our colleague, our leader, our guide. So amazing grace. Douglas experienced grace. Rod shared so clearly how Douglas experienced grace. So let's think about that grace that saved a wretch like me. And let's sing to him, uh, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, as we stand together. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves.
Father God, it's by grace. It's always been by grace in Christ. Before the foundation of the world, Lord, you ordained this day, this day of celebration and life. And Lord, you reach out by grace, even now, and deeply into our hearts. And Lord, without grace, we are but nothing. And so we honor you as the God of grace. Amen. Amen. Won't you please be seated? Imagine for a moment that we're at the main train station in Paris, the Gare du Nord, probably the, the busiest train station in all of Europe, a place with so many trains going in so many different directions. There you are. Can you picture it? It's a busy, busy place. There's noise. Uh, there's language that you don't understand. You're in a quandary. There are trains going north. There are trains going south. There are trains going east, and there are trains going west. And which train is best suited for you in your particular life's journey? The noise, the language, the currency are not making it easy at all. You're in a quandary, you're in a predicament. And then you, you feel this little gentle tap on your shoulder. And as you turn around, there's this benevolent, kind-looking man who's smiling at you. And he says to you, can I help you? I wonder how many people Douglas Crawford was able to help simply by saying, can I help you? Can I help you? This long life lived so well by Douglas, we might well ask, I mean, how was he able to sustain it? Even though there were the dips, how was he able to sustain it, you know, all those years? He's uh, 40 years older than I am, and uh, I came to know Doug over the years, but pretty well when I got here 17 odd years ago. And like many other ministers, he was the one that got Shirley and I here. We got the phone call, as a number of ministers did, as Rory Spence did at um, Gap Church in town. Um, you know, Murray, Rory, would you consider, would you consider Summerstrand as an option? And he did that to so many ministers, and then there would be this period of discernment. Uh, and then, you know, phone back, and Doug would say, no, I still think you're the right one. No matter what you may be thinking, I still think you're the right one. And so he had that influence in so many of our lives. So Douglas was a person of conviction in an uncertain world. He really was. He, be he believed in, in, in the word of God. And unlike uh, you know, a number of ministers today or those theologians who, who sort of look, look down on the word, uh, Douglas lifted up the word. And he was quite happy to submit to its authority and yield to its authority. He believed in the truth of God's word, that it was a reliable word and a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. Like his, his favorite psalm, Psalm 121, you know it well, I lift up my eyes to the mountains, to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. This is a watch over psalm. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going. Even when you're at the train station, not quite sure which train to take both now and forevermore. Douglas loved God. He knew this watch over God in the highs and the lows of his life. Early on in our time here, Shirley and I, in the year 2000, 2001, 2003, 2004, we would meet weekly to pray with Douglas and Rhoda. What a privilege. What a privilege to hear Douglas pray. It was a conversation with a God he knew so, so well that you would begin to engage with him in his prayers. He started giving instruction to God in a, in a mutual dialogue, a little like Moses, you know, uh, who knew and, and, and felt that he could, you know, be involved in the decisions God was making, which is true, isn't it, in a way. And what a time, 
you know, in our early lives and our ministry here and our children were still little. Our children remember Douglas as the one who gave them chocolates. I think it was Rhoda who, who was buying it all, but when they were really small, and they were really small when we got here, um, uh, he would give them uh, chocolate per year. So if you were three, then you, you, know, you had three chocolates, four, four chocolates, and they found this just great, um, that he would be so kind. Uh, through Rhoda and remember them. And they still remember that today. Douglas was a person of conviction in a world of uncertainty. He was also a person who was at peace in the storms of life. And there were many. And I knew Douglas. Sometimes he would create his own storms. Um, you know, when we got here, he, he said to me, Murray, I'm going to leave the church for three months. And if I like what you're doing when I come back, I'll stick around. And if, if you have something for me, for me to do, I'll do it. Um, and he did. And we worked together for a number of years. You know, he was in his 70s already, his early 70s, and our Sunday school didn't have much leadership. So he said, I'll do that. And he led our Sunday school significantly. He trained teachers, he equipped young people, and he simply said to me, Murray, but Jesus said, bring the little children to me. And although I'm older, I'll do it. Because Jesus said it. He loved John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And that was Douglas, wasn't it? He showed the way to many. He led many to the truth. And he lived this life of the gospel. Always there would be an appeal during a service. Murray don't have a service without an appeal for people to follow Jesus. Because it's all about Jesus. Jesus goes on to say, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Praying and working with Douglas was a privilege he was at peace. He would often bring calm into situations. And finally, he was a person who accepted, this is what I loved about him, he accepted and challenged the ambiguities of life and the church. Because the church is called to be something that we are often not, isn't it? We are called to be holy, but we are often unholy. We are called to be a people who love God, and often we worship, and then we don't love him. We're called to love our neighbor, but often we don't love our neighbors. we should. Often the church should be a place of refuge and healing, and sometimes it's a place of conflict and sadness. But Douglas accepted the ambiguities, but he also challenged them. He also liked to speak into circumstances, and that's why his, and Tristan, absolutely, his, his messages and his life and his prayer and his, always had a prophetic edge. And he loved the work of the Holy Spirit, didn't he? He loved the work of the Spirit. He would always say, well, the Spirit has led you to God, but there's always so much more. And he loved water. And you talk about the Spirit as water, the overflow. You need to be swimming. And your life and ministry needs to have life. It needs to have an overflow in it. And that's really what sustained him in ministry. He spoke about that significant time in his own ministry when the Holy Spirit confronted him. And uh, he was down in Cape Town at the time, and he used to speak about how his ministry lacked love. But when he met the Spirit, he was filled with God's love. And his messages took on this warmth and this beauty. 1 Corinthians 15, this last passage of Douglas's, So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable is raised imperishable. Listen to the ambiguities. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. 
If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus, a life-giving spirit. Douglas, his whole life was sustained by the spirit, even in those ambiguous times. He was a little like John the Baptist, who pointed to, you know, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And just like John who baptized with water, he said, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who fills us, the Spirit who sustains. Where would a church be? Where would we be without the Holy Spirit empowering us, equipping us to live for Jesus? Paul concludes, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will all be changed. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. That's true, isn't it, friends? That's why we're here today. That's why this is a celebration of the life. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine again, friends, you're at that train station, and you've got some decisions to make. Many trains going in many directions. Where are you at this point in your life? Douglas chose the train. He chose well. He chose the way, the truth and the life of the Lord Jesus. Are you sure? Have you chosen that one? Are you living gloriously and wonderfully for him? Are you living in the forgiveness God has given and the sacrificial lamb that was given up for you and I that we may live not just now but eternally? And Father, in these quiet moments, as we bow our heads before you, as we consider the wonder of your love, the Lord Jesus Christ, and Douglas came to Rod those years ago, and he needed someone to speak to about his life, a confessor. Well, friends, we all have a great high priest. And as Rod led dug to Jesus so again and again and and vice versa as he did for us. So Jesus invites us into that holy place, an unholy people, an imperfect people coming into the presence of a perfect God. The answer is always the gospel. God gave us the very best of himself. And then he became sin for us on the cross that we may be forgiven. And so friends, as we consider his great love, as we put our our very lives into his hands once again, may we not leave here with any regrets at all. May we leave here today with a deep sense of God's love, of Christ's love, of the Holy Spirit's empowering, that our love for God may grow, that our love for one another may grow, that our love for his church may grow with all its ambiguities, and our love for the lost world that does not know him yet may grow. Amen. Shall we stand together? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. And as we have been
entrusted our brother Douglas Crawford into the hands of God, and we now commit his body to the elements, earth to earth, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Having our whole trust and confidence in the mercy of our Heavenly Father, and in the victory of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died, was buried and rose again for us, and who is alive and who reigns forevermore. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and of Hades. And so, Father, we trust our dear friend, our colleague, father, grandfather, husband, into your hands from whence he came. Long may the journey continue, Father, with you. As now he sees you face to face, as now he is embraced by you, as you have said to him, well done, my good and faithful servant. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have one final song to sing, and it's not on the hymn sheet it's going to be up on the screen uh, it's jerusalem um, rhoda left with <coughs> jerusalem douglas will leave with jerusalem and friends in the last um, chorus uh, the family will leave and i will leave too in the blink of an eye i'll be gone i won't come back <laughs> so, so don't wait for a benediction because the service will continue in the hall as we commune together with the family so please do come through uh, for that and then yeah, in the final verse let's sing to him let's sing to this magnificent God this King of Kings this Lord of Lords let's honor him Last night I lay sleeping, there came a dream so fair.